Welcome. I'm Pradeep Devata from uh, University of Cambridge, Judge Business School. Uh, in this video, I'll be presenting a case of, of financial services industry, which is relevant to the uh, NGCDI project at BT. Specifically, we'll be looking at the example of algorithmic trading, which is widely used in the investment banking business. In, in the rest of this uh, presentation, I would uh, look at some background and introductory material before going looking into specific risk and governance issues in algorithmic trading, and then look at how to uh, combine and integrate those issues at a higher organizational, uh, that is enterprise level. So with that, um, I just wanted to uh, identify some parallels with BT. Like, uh, like, like BT, uh, like BT financial services uh, industry is, is highly regulated. There are, there are similar issues about human involvement in automated decision making and uh, human machine interface. And finally, with this, uh, with this project, the idea for is for the BT to move towards uh, full converged uh, automation. And uh, our example here, uh, Barclays in the financial service in industry, is a potential uh, benchmark or blueprint for the risk management and governance models at BT. A bit about uh, a bit about Barclays. Barclays, uh, like BT, is a British organization. And if you look at this annual report, uh, out of the four key resources they mentioned, uh, three, three of them are parallel with BT. Like any organization, obviously, there's people, but technology and infrastructure like BT is, is very prominent and important at Barclays. And there is uh, the operations and governance as a, as a key resource at Barclays as well. So, Algorithmic trading uh, didn't happen overnight, and it is a result of a series of digital transformation over a time period in financial services. So I wanted to specifically point out three major uh, sort of trans points of transformation. The first was in 1990s, and that was about electronic trading. What that means is uh, people who had to buy and sell previously had to gather at a physical space. Um, often the stock exchanges to buy and sell particular financial instruments. With electronic trading, that changed. That changed because the, and the, work, the how people used to uh, trade changed because people didn't have to be at uh, physical space anymore. Uh, that does feel a long time ago now, uh, but that's um, that changed everything. And very importantly, what that made is made the whole business of buying selling a data business a digitally. Uh, data enabled business that could be captured. Now the second point of uh, second major transformation point is in early 2000s when the high performance computing made its uh, made its road into sort of investment banking and what that meant is a specific desk within within an investment bank while they could do a certain number of transitions today because it took time to sort of estimate how much it uh, should be priced at, what the negotiations should be, and, um, and, and sort of go through that process. They could all of a sudden do what they could do in a day, in, in seconds and minutes. And a, a good example of that is uh, in when, I was work, when I was there in financial services in early 2000s, there was this overnight batches, which ran for six to eight hours minimum uh, to try to price hundreds of thousands of financial um, instruments. Now, all of a sudden, with uh, use of high-performance computing, that could be done in minutes. So that's, that, that was a huge leap. And that changed the, changed the field and ability to do things more complex, things more quickly. And uh, more recently, in the last decade, as we know, the AI, artificial intelligence, and machine learning technologies have been making their inroad. And, uh, that's actually providing more scale, more opportunities to innovate 
and uh, do things at scale uh, further, you know, scale, make that scale bigger uh, and at, at a less expensive. Uh, and that's, that's continuing to change the industry uh, now. Now with that, uh, I wanted to also sort of highlight that the complexity of algorithms have been going up. Uh, and uh, and that, 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 that's one of the main reasons behind looking at the risk and governance uh, for them. Now, before, before we move uh, any further on our algorithmic trading, uh, let's just have a quick look at the definition. So uh, regulation has caught up in financial services in this space, and uh, they, they have a pretty standard definition of what algorithmic trading is. And in this case, uh, in this slide, it uh, says it's a computer algorithm, which essentially uh, doesn't involve humans making any decisions. The algorithm makes decisions about when to initiate the order, when to do it, the timing, the price, the quantity, and so on. So just think about to think about an example. If you're if you're a client of Barclays, uh, and you have you have provided 10 million pounds to Barclays um, under this algorithmic trading. Uh, algorithmic trading product. That algorithm is going to decide what, when, and how uh, to, to buy, uh, buy different financial products for, to, for that 10 million pounds. And again, it will constantly sort of um, look at uh, how to, when to sell and reinvest in what area. Now, as we discussed in the previous slide, this would not have been possible had the financial market itself been not digital. And I have a quick view of that uh, for a market, spot FX market, where you essentially change currencies. Uh, so for example, pounds to euros and pound to dollars and so on. And that shows how that market has evolved over time to become a, uh, a majority digitally driven market. For some other, other markets like equities, that's even uh, further up really. It's um, it's easy to think. It's easy to think why why as an organization, Barclays and other financial services organization would adopt algorithmic trading, and I would, uh, I would guess that there are many parallels within BT. So an obvious one is greater scale and efficiency. So generally, when you try to do more, it, it incurs more cost. You need more people, but when it's done by the machine, it's uh, the scale is not a problem. You can do more but not necessarily adding more cost. So your per unit cost keeps falling. Second is improved service offering. In this case, algorithm can execute fast. They can find better price because there is no lack of decision-making. You can also more customize the products based on the requirements of, the, of your clients, introduce new innovation, new strategies uh, fairly quickly. And finally, the reduced risks. When you do things at scale, if, if a lot of human time is involved, human becomes tired, human makes human operational errors. And this, this could cost money. So those sort of risks, once you have a, uh, with, with an algorithm, you can replicate the contract that the, the organization has with the customer. And all those issues around operational problems uh, go out of the window. So that actually is a significant reduction in risk. So however, um, you know, if, if you are a, as a customer putting money and you know an algorithm is, uh, is, is working on it, as a customer, you, you need to uh, feel comfortable and you know you don't want things to go wrong. And this is, this is sort of well recognized uh, within within the financial services industry and by Barclays. And uh, trading algorithms as a risk factor find a specific mention within the annual report in Barclays. So as you can see here, uh, they talk about risks of duplicated transitions, the risks of system outrage, the risk around group's ability to price, uh, price its products, and also that uh, it can have a large material adverse effect on the group's business, its operation, its financial condition, 
and uh, and and its reputation. So there are pretty significant uh, risks uh, that's 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 um, that's there that comes with with the use of algorithm. Continuing the risk theme, uh, so the, even outside Barclays, the the risk around algorithmic trading is well uh, understood and and discussed on multiple platforms. So the, the, I, I want to highlight sort of three three major ones. One is speed. When algorithms are at work in markets, things happen very quickly. And while uh, you know, in a few seconds, a lot of lot of things can change in the market. While as humans, we are pretty much unable to comprehend and process that in such a time such time period. Second is about abrupt disruption. What's happening with algorithms and sort of AI driven systems is we are moving from a mixed human machine phase where we have been, human have been a important part of the game to a completely machine driven regime. And that, um, that's completely changed things. And that's combined, combines with more what's known as frequent black swan events. So what, that means that previously, when we experience these extreme events once in a while, they happen more frequently. Because the machine is more responsive, more things happening, more quickly things are happening. Finally, a very important point, um, accountability. If machines are driving things, machines are making the decisions, how do we fix accountability with people? So all these are very, very important uh, risks. Uh, and governance discussions, particularly in the algorithm of trading, as well as uh, automation driven by artificial intelligence and machine learning. So it's well understood that risk, while you reduce risk, operational risk, with use of algorithms and models, we also amplify certain risks. And any risk, any risk. So if the human actor is involved, they're making one mistake that probably affects one transition or a few transactions. But when, when algorithm and uh, models are at play, if they are wrong, they make the same mistake all across at the same time in a very small period of time. And that exposes the risk, amplifies the risk. Some of the risks that uh, we have either covered or well recognized are intensifying volatility. What that means is things change rapidly and things change more. Ripple effects. One thing happening at one place affects other things. For example, if the investment bank, you know, FX market is involved, that affects equities. If, um, if one side of the bank um, is involved, investment bank, that actually affects business in other side or one bank like Lehman Brothers, when it collapses, it takes down the entire financial services industry and other industry along with it. And flash crisis, and these are, these are quick, uh, where you know stock markets go down very quickly or the price change very quickly. For example, Brexit, where when the pound uh, value of pound uh, changed massively against against dollar and other currencies. Now we uh, at an enterprise level, there is an established uh, governance uh, framework that's known as three lines of defense model that came firstly in 1970s, but since has evolved and has been adopted uh, and. Uh, Financial services industry was the first adopter, but it has it is adopted now across industries. And te telecoms does use it as well. Now that uh, that model there, that's a quick visualization of of um, of the three lines of de uh, defense model, where the governing body is generally presented by sort of the board level, uh, and the management is sort of line of business and the support functions, and the third line of defense are uh, is independent insurance through internal audit functions. On the top, there is also external assurance uh, function that is external audit, as well as regulator playing their part. Now we'll see that, um, see this sort of enterprise level uh, framework, as well as uh, how, that's, how that's applied at, at, uh, at a individual algorithmic trading or individual automation level in the following slides. So what we are saying seeing here is, is how do you 
apply the first line of defense for algorithm algorithm trading. Now, in this example here, the first line of defense is owned by the business line. That's essentially the line of business of the commercial owner of the business, as well as the developers, developers who are developing algorithms for the purpose of the doing business. And this is about the approach to, to the, the approach to development of the algorithm or model. And there are two key points, two key points uh, to, to sort of take away. The first is experimentation. And this is about experimenting while developing the models. And that's because as humans, we cannot predict. We cannot predict what models are going to do. All we can do is to make sure that we use an exhaustive, uh, exhaustive we have an exhaustive framework uh, to experiment that the models are are working as they should. And to do that, you need to do many scenarios, many what if analysis, and so on. Secondly, and especially when uh, there is a change, there is a change in the algorithm or model, uh, what's, what Bartlett does is they resort to incremental updating, small changes. They don't go about changing the whole thing or changing major changes because major changes in a complex environment could uh, throw risks that's not well understood and not well captured. So they generally resort to small changes. There is a second, uh, there is a second slide on first line of defense. And the first slide was about developing sort of the models and algorithm. The second, second, the second slide about first line of defense is about running it, running the business day to day using algorithm and models. And this focuses on the monitoring and accountability area. And this is owned by, again, by the business line or commercial lines, uh, line of business, and the immediate support functions, finance, risk, uh, operations that support that day-to-day -day running of the business. So what sort of, what sort of things they are looking into? What, 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 what are the, how do they ensure that? First, uh, looking at the patterns, patterns in the data. So there is data being used to train that algorithm and run that algorithm or, or the model. And there is a, it's very important to make sure that data is not biased in any way. A biased data or biased input could create a biased outcome. And that's a huge risk. So that you, you need skilled, you need skilled humans, skilled risk managers, skilled people to, to be able to actually see, see that if data has problems and identify that and, and address that. Then there is this, uh, the third thing is about explainability. Explainability is super important. How do you explain a decision? With the use of more and more sort of machine learning, it's very difficult to explain uh, what are the exact processes that happen. In, in, in financial services and in places like Barclays, if somebody was, uh, your client was turned down for credit, you need to be explained, you need to be able to explain that to the client and also to the regulator actually. So you need uh, human actors playing their part to, to explain that. or you have the capability of explaining that within the model. And finally, you need some sort of control, some kind of switch up, uh, which, which changes the control from machine to human if things really go wrong. And, and you, again, you need uh, the first line of business and the support functions to, uh, to do that. And that's what's done in our case in Barclays. Now, second line of, now we'll move to the second line of difference. And, and algorithmic trading, uh, that, that is about model risk management. So we, we talked about first line of defense developing models. But how do you go about uh, actually managing those models and managing risks around that? And in here, I've got, um, got a whole sort of workflow process uh, around, uh, which is this, this is, this is based on a work done on McKinsey. Uh, 
and uh, there's a whole workflow how to go about it. But sort of the key activities a model risk management uh, does is first correctly identifying models, recording that in model inventory. Uh, in financial services, what happened is they started working with models and the model risk management practice followed. But now, uh, especially after financial crisis, things have changed as in you can't actually use a model less. It's okay. You cannot prove that it's uh, already managed through the model list management framework. So the first activity is to be able to record those models, uh, make sure that every model has an owner who is accountable for that model. As we saw, the line of business and the model developer has to be accountable for that. Uh, the model owner must sign up the models prior to um, they have to sign up the models that they have been, they have, they meet certain standards. And they have done the test and they cannot be really, cannot be put into production. Models cannot be put into production until they have been validated by this independent function. This independent validation unit will check that the model has gone through all the testing by retesting them and having independent uh, way to test them and look at its fit for purpose. Uh, so model function oversees that every model is subject to validation and are approved for for its uh, for the purpose of its use, and that's very important. Model must be used for its purpose and not beyond. And finally, it defines the model is appetite in terms of risk tolerance and essentially supporting the board uh, in that uh, respect and develop quantitative and qualitative metrics that can be used to track and report model risk. So that's the second line of defense as it looks specifically for application of uh, application in algorithm trading. Uh, and then there is third line of defense, which is the internal um, assurance as well as sort of external assurance. And uh, the purpose of third line of defense is essentially making sure that the priorities that's already defined by the first line and the second line are actually being done properly, are be actually being met. So they will they develop the processes and uh, process in place. They audit, they do audit reviews, assurance reviews to make sure what was meant to happen happens to make sure things don't run, uh, things don't, don't go out of control. Now here, everything we have talked about, about algorithmic trading, uh, first line, second line, and third line. This is a single slide view of that, uh, that sort of process. So here on, for the, down, uh, the first box from the bottom, is, is essentially the first line, which is sort of model users and developers, so line of business and developers. They engage, they are responsible and accountable for development of model, its implementation and its use. But they cannot implement and the model and use the model until they go through a second line of defense for the model validation, which is the middle box here which also who also make sure that there is a annual model review process and ongoing model risk monitoring in place. And then uh, there is a reporting function that sort of captures all those metrics and, and which and reported to sort of senior executives in risk, which assess and compare them against the model risk appetite of the firm, uh, decide whether they need to escalate about in a, any inappropriate use of the model and oversee so the model is um, governance. And on the, in the right, you see all these things need to be embedded in policies, procedures, and responsibilities. And what that means, these things also need to be in procedures and policies for line of business that needs to be a requirement for them for this to work from the risk side. So we th so this is again one snapshot view for um, an individual process and in this case algorithmic trading. 
And then uh, we just, to finish off that discussion, I wanted to mention regulatory compliance. In addition to the first line, second line, and third line of defense, we also have regulator making sure in financial services industry that things are on, under control. And regulatory regime is quite developed uh, for sort of automation and machine driven processes. So regulators have actually uh, pres has prescribed that an organization like Barclays has to meet these requirements. So many of the things that we discussed are not necessarily anymore an option or good practices. It is a necessity from a regulatory perspective to run the business. Now, this slide here talks about the enterprise level governance at Barclays. Uh, so this is sort of three line of defense model, but how does it look in terms of the structure? So Barclays PLC board obviously sits at the top where there are board committees, uh, where there are board committees about around risk and governance. So there is a board risk committee, there is a board audit committee, and together they, um, there's obviously this remuneration committee here, but from a risk perspective, the key committees are sort of risk committee and audit committee. And as you can see, there is a group risk committee that reports to these board level committees. And then in turn, group risk committee, which is again, enterprise level, um, is fed by Barclays group product versus risk type committees. What that means is for every product and every risk category, there is a committee reviewing that either risk specific criteria at different product level or at a product level, different risk, um, different risk that's present there. Now, here I have combined the two individual, the individual model level governance to, with the sort of Barclays enterprise level governance. So you can see how individual level governance sort of are categorized through these different risk categories, strategic, operational, reputational, and so on. And that then sort of feeds into this group level product risk committees, and then gets more integrated as we go up. Also, in addition to this risk framework, line of business products, which are essentially owner, owners of risk, also report to these risk committees. And again, as, a, as, a, as an organization, as an enterprise, Barclays has to interact with regulators. So all these all this uh, different uh, areas of the bank also have to take into consideration in regulatory requirements. This is where it comes together. You can see the overall risk structure and governance structure uh, for Barclays, uh, right from individual process or individual model level, right up to the board level and enterprise level. So to sort of finish off, um, so there, are at least, there are at least three sort of takeaways that I identified. Uh, one, benchmarks, benchmarks for highly automated and machine driven processes do exist. Uh, is that we can we can look at uh, comprehensive governance structure and processes are critical are critical in in sort of AI and ML driven environment for risk management and risk management and control becomes more complex with highly automated environments and you need more highly skilled people there. With that, I wanted to thank you for your time. And I would love, we would love to, as a team, would love to hear your thoughts and questions around this, uh, around this case study and how things relate uh, to in this case study with BT. We'd love to have a chat uh, with you and have follow-up sessions. Please reach out to us. Thank you very much.